next we'll be moving to an interactive session uh, again till we make some technological arrangement there are some questions that are coming from the chat uh, and i will be passing on these questions to dr stanley amarasekara mm, yeah one question is what should be the bp cutoff for thrombolysis dr amarasekara yeah uh, when you have a uh, era of uh, streptokinase we know that the blood pressure we have uh, about 180 of uh, systole and a diastole of 110 100 uh, but they are all relative because we can bring it down with uh, gtn infusion and then uh, you can go with uh, uh, whatever the uh, the fibrinolytics but on the question comes when the patient is in shock but the, when the patient is in shock when the blood pressure is below 90 then the the fibrinolytics doesn't work Therefore, these patients should go for uh, interventional procedures and they can be, until interventional procedures are done, they can be managed with uh, low milk, heparin or heparin and then uh, arrangement should be made to get this patient into the cat lab. Uh, next question is also related to the same. What's the advantage of heparin or inoxifarin? Yeah, now, uh, and when it comes to ST elevation MI, we have just mentioned in our previous lecture that the, the, if the patient goes to the cath lab, it's very easy to calculate the dosage of heparin for topping up uh, in the process of uh, angiography and interventions. Therefore, the patient should be loaded first if possible with uh, low molecular heparin. The bolus dose is you can start with the 300, uh, 3000 units and then you can make it 1000 units per hour or else you can uh, transfer the patient with 3000 units of bolus to uh, a cath lab facility and then uh, after loading with the antiplatelets. But of course, the present criteria is to not to give the P2Y12 receptors until you know the coronary anatomy. And uh, topping off of uh, heparin can be done in the cath lab. Uh, but if there is no cath lab facility in, uh, in a non-cath lab facility, of course, uh, fibrinolytics ha has to be accompanied with uh, unfractionated heparin. And uh, one final question before we move on. What are the safer drugs to control blood pressure uh, in STEMI in advantage to IVGTN? Yeah, now uh, in this setup, of course, if you know the renal functions and the patient who is already on AC inhibitors, patient who is on IRBs, if they are coming with an ST elevation MI, there is no harm continuing with the same medication. But if you don't know the patient's uh, renal functions, and if the patient has uh, bradycardia, it is always better to go with a uh, uh, amlodipine or uh, nifedipine or that type of drug. But if the patient has tachycardia, it is always better to go with a beta, beta blocker in the absence of severe heart failure. But uh, of course, the GTN will be a valuable drug to control in acute phase uh, and then uh, control the blood pressure because you don't want to lower the blood pressure in these situations because there is a sympathetic override and then the pressure goes up in a situation of ischemia. It is probably a transient uh, phenomena. So this is best managed with the GTN or uh, you know, I would uh, reserve uh, until we uh, do the procedure and then we'll start on AC inhibitors or ARBs. Uh, not like there are good old days that we straight away go with the beta blockers, the AC inhibitors and uh, beta blockers immediately. But, but if the patient has to go on a medical management, if the patient comes late, of course, then you, you have to consider all these uh, other medications. Thank you, uh, Dr. Amar Sekar, for that valuable information. Now we'll be moving to the uh, case discussion, the interest in acute coronary syndrome presentations. The case-based discussion, this will be jointly conducted by Dr. Arva Vijay Singh, who is the consultant cardiologist from Base Hospital Panadura, and uh, Dr. Stanley Amar Sekar, consultant cardiologist and the, and the president of the college. Uh, Dr. Aruna will be starting. Yeah, a few words about the SLMA and I must thank the president and the SLMA, the organizing committee for inviting us to join for this uh, foundation sessions. And from the cardiology, we have actually put uh, some practical uh, situations. And today we are going to discuss some of the, the interesting ACS uh, practical ECGs and the case scenarios. And uh, Dr. Aruna will be presenting it. I'll be discussing it. Okay, thank you, sir. First of all, I would like to thank SLMA for giving this opportunity. More than the ECG, the most important thing is the clinical presentation of the patient. So we have to interpret ECGs with 
in the background of clinical presentation. Otherwise, we don't have to interpret ECG isolatedly without considering patients other factors. So the, we will move to the first case. It's a 56 year old lady with well controlled type 2 diabetes for three years. She came with intermittent retrosternal chest pain. Uh, so first of all, can we move to the Q&A and then we can go to the case discussion? Is it possible? Okay, first, uh, first we will see a few questions to assess your knowledge and then after that we will go to the proper case discussion and all the answers will be in the case discussion. The first questions, first case is based on this question. 56 year old lady with, with well controlled type 2 diabetes for 3 years admitted with intermittent retrosternal chest discomfort for last 24 hours. Multiple episodes at rest. Each episode lasts 5 to 10 minutes and she has having GRD intermittently and taken uh, PPI but uh, it's not pain is not relieved. Patient came to the ETU and high sensitivity troponin was done and it's mildly positive. The ECG shows this is the ECG. You can carefully go through the ECG. And the questions uh, you have to select the best answer. This patient managed as a lower risk non STEMI with enoxaparin for three days, standard regime, and exercise ECG in six weeks and if positive for CAT. Otherwise, this, uh, as patient symptoms are not very clear, we can do a symptom limited exercise ECG before discharge and depending on the finding, we can decide for the management. Oh, this is a STEMI and need primary PCI. Fifth one is, this can be a chest pain, young um, pulmonary embolism. So CTPA is the next investigation. Oh, this ECG indicate very tight proximal LAD disease. We'll move back to our ECG. Ask for the poll. Okay, can you go for the poll, please? Any answers from the audience? Oh. Have we got have we got anybody answer? It's there. Answer. Okay, you can answer yeah. now. Yeah, it's coming. It's coming. Ah, it's coming. But it doesn't appear there, is it? Did anybody answer? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Majority answered five. Ah, good, excellent. Excellent. I think they have got the correct answer. Yeah. Can you put the ECG back, please? Can you put back the ECG? Uh, back to the ECG, please. Back to the ECG. Uh, yes. Okay. Looking at this ECG, and the ECG is in sinus rhythm. The heart rate is around uh, just below 100. And the axis is normal. PR interval is normal. May we discuss the case with the other ECGs after this Q&A? Just to assess their knowledge. And after this, we will go for the case discussion. Is it okay? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. yeah. And the, the ne next question, 36 year old male with no significant past medical history admitted with a severe chest uh, class 3 ang uh, angina for last couple of days. Troponin is significantly positive. So this is the ECG. So the answer should be this is a AVR STEMI thrombolysis with TN tinecta place if no primary PCI is available with reasonable time limit. AVR STEMI indicates STEMI involved in right ventricle. Third response is this is almost always due to severe left main disease. Fourth answer is continue subcut inoxaparin for three days and send for elective angiogram. Fifth one, this patient need an urgent coronary angiogram. So basically ECG, this is the ECG. These are the answers. Can we go for the poll? Go for the poll, please. In 20 seconds. Oh, 
Okay. Thanks. Um, twenty five answered five, and twenty two answered one. Okay, there is some some discrepancy discrepancy between yes. answers. We'll when we discuss the cases, we'll find the answer. Then can you go to the slide slow show? Okay, the third the third question. one. The fifty four year old male with diabetic hypertension and dyslipidemia admitted with acute onset shortness of breath with central tightness for few hours. No history of ischemic heart disease. Blood pressure is one hundred and sixty. Few basal crepes. No murmurs. ECG. So the, the what is the best management option? CTPA to exclude pulmonary embolism. Urgent echo to exclude aortic dissection. High sensitivity troponin at uh, and uh, at admission and repeat at one hour to rule out acute MI. Start inoxaparin and manage as non-STEMI or repeat ECG with additional leads. The best management option. Pauline, please. Yeah, start it. Start it. Majority five, forty three. Yeah. 43 got okay repetition yeah the question number 4 42 year old patient with dyslipidemia defaulted management family history of premature ischemic heart disease in paternal side ex smoker admitted with significant central chest pain uh, patient came to the hospital within 30 minutes this is the ecg The best option would be since his ECG is normal, GRD, GR, GORD is the likely diagnosis. And the second option would be wait for six hours for troponin and if it's positive, manage as non STEMI. Third one, send to cardiologist for urgent echo. Fourth one, CT angiogram, autogram to exclude aortic dissection. Five, this is a hyperacute T wave and need multiple repeated ECGs. Okay, for the poll. Majority got that has five. The last case. A man in his 50s with history of type 2 diabetes, hypertension and dyslipidemia presented with one day history of on and off chest and upper abdomen epigastric pain. He had woken up from sleep earlier and he described it as gas pain located in the upper epigastrium and radiating upwards. Examination was normal but he looks ill and very sweaty. The ECG on admission. The best answers start dextrose insulin for hyperkalemia because of very tall T waves, manage as non STEMI. This can be a bleeding peptic ulcer, therefore, call the surgeon urgently. This is AVR STEMI, need thrombolysis. This indicates very proximal LAD occlusion.
Okay, let's go to the, go to the case discussion now. It's the very first case. I think most of the people have a very good understanding of what I'm what we are going to discuss. Uh, thanks to Dr. Sambath. So the first case, 56 year old lady with type 2 diabetes for th uh, three years, admitted with intermittent red cross tunnel chest pain. So this is the very first ECG. Yeah, now this ECG, if everyone looks at it, uh, you know, in, in the first glance, it looks like a normal ECG with sinus rhythm, normal PR interval, axis is normal. But if you carefully look at it, that you can see a slight T wave inversions, probably beginning at V2, V3 and V4. And if you repeat this ECG, yeah, when you see there is no gross abnormality, at least if you can't diagnose anything, best thing is to repeat the ECG in at least half an hour. Patient was pain-free, troponin was done, routine blood was sent, query management was query GORD. So this is a repeat ECG, more or less the same. More or right? less the same, repeat ECG. But troponin came as normal, so acute MI was ruled out and the ETUP uh, team thought it's a GRD and patient plan was the plan was to discharge him. But while awaiting discharge, patient get another chest discomfort and the pain again settled with IV omeprazole. However, there was an emergency medicine SR on call and he requested she requested a repeat ECG before discharge. Now you can see in this ECG there are some biphasic T wave inversions in V2, V3, and V4. And these biphasic T inversions, and there is a little bit of symmetrical T inversion in V5, and involvement of the L1 AVL, this suggests that this patient has a significant obstruction in the proximal LAD. And therefore, these patients basically should not be subjected to exercise stress ECGs or they should not be discharged, particularly in the, these type of ECGs can be sub subtle and sometimes they can have uh, slight troponin elevations and also pseudo normalization together with the pain and remember that this indicates a very proximal LAD lesion and these patients should be subjected to coronary angiography straight away. Ideally 10 to, percent, 10 to 15 percent of all our uh, non-STEMI or unstable acute coronary syndrome presentations can be this. Unfortunately, the, most of these patients, we, are, we will miss most of these patients because dynamic ECG, negative troponin or mildly elevated troponin, so low, they will be treated as either unstable angina or low risk non stemi That's what happened to this patient and then she was, she, up to day 3, inoxaparin was continued and planned to stop inoxaparin on day 3, echo discharge and review in 2 weeks time. This is the repeat ECG on day 3, still you can see biphasic T inversions. Uh, this uh, actually before discharge ECG, there is uh, some improvement of the ECG appearance has improved compared to the previous ECG. And patient underwent a, after contacting cardiology team, patient underwent a early angiogram before discharge and it shows proximal LAD tight lesion which yes. So this is actually Wellen syndrome. Wellen syndrome, this is another patient, serial presentations, you can see near normal ECGs from the beginning. There are no major abnormalities. But with time they develop biphasic or symmetrical deep, in, deep, deep T inversions in the anterior leads. This is a classical example. So what is Wellen syndrome? It is a ischemic chest pain, T waves inversion or biphasic T in anterior leads. Troponin will be either normal, uh, negative or minimally elevated. There is important thing is no pathological Q waves on the precordial leads and there is no poor R wave progression. But sometimes you might see reverse R wave progression where V1, the V2 R is smaller than V1 or V3 is R is smaller than V2. This is called reverse R wave progression. This is not normal at all. So if, the, if you see a patient, ischemic type chest pain, biphasic or T and uh, anterior T inversions with minimally or normal troponin, no Q waves. This is a Wellen syndrome, and the significance is this is very proximal LAD. So, most of them will develop massive anterior MI within next couple of weeks. 
this is the best time to save the myocardium so they need early angiogram before they develop a STEMI. The second case, this is a 36-year-old male with no significant past medical history. He had a new onset class 3 angina for last couple of days. He, so he was a heavy smoker. So on admission, his troponin is 25,000, significantly high. Routine bloods were normal. This is the e ECG. Now, he is a young man and he is a heavy smoker. Now, in this ECG, you can, you can see it's pretty obvious that fish ECG is in sinus rhythm and the rate is within normal limits. But the hallmark is the AVRST is elevated against diffused ST depressions. In L1, A, A, AVL, lead 2, lead 5, 6, 2, 3, everything. So if you see B1 and AVR ST elevation, you must think of uh, a significant left main or left main equivalent disease. And these patients, although it is in guidelines classified as ST elevation MI of AVR, there are very few of them have the clots in the left main, but they can be, there can be a clot in the LAD. But in a left main situation, you should not give the reperfusion uh, treatment for these patients. These patients should be sent for coronary angiography. And uh, that's the most important thing of recognizing this. But this is not limited to uh, left main disease. The VRST elevation can be subjected to different conditions as well. But in the given case scenario of acute coronary syndrome, that this has to be taken as left main. This is the echocardiogram of the same patient. You can see very poor LV function, basic. There is marked reduction of ejection fraction with the um, multiple wall motion abnormalities are seen. The coronary angiogram confirms the left main disease. As you can see, it is the, the, the left main, distal left main involving the ostium of the lady and the circumflex both. And patient underwent successful PCI to left main to a lady and a lady bifurcation, the right side, right shoulder after PCI. So ST elevation in AVR, as Dr. Stanley Amrasekhar said, it's not specific to LMC occlusion, but it can be presented, it can present it either proximal LAD occlusion, severe triple SL disease, or the most important thing is significant subendocardial ischemia due to supply uh, demand mismatch, such as SCTs, fast atrial fibrillation, septic shock, or acute bleeding. So whenever you see ST elevation in AVR, with uh, associated with widespread ST depression, it is not acute coronary syndrome. First thing is you have to exclude non-acute coronary syndrome things because management will be different. So always look for septic uh, sepsis, acute bleeding, severe, high, uh, any evidence of hyperperfusion. So if they, after excluding those things, you can look for evidence of acute coronary syndrome as well. And please do not uh, comment on uh, reperfusion treatment like uh, streptokinase or tenecryptase at this moment immediately. Yeah. So the the actually, if you go through the 12 leads of ECG, this is a funny lead because almost our other 11 e e ECG leads have their specific designated myocardial mass, but AVR itself has no myocardial mass. So actually, it's looking for the mouth of the LV cavity. So L ST elevation in the AVR usually a manifestation of the severe, uh, it's a reciprocal ST elevation due to the ST depression in the LV cavity. So actually this, even though this is called ST elevation in the AVR ST elevation, ideally this is a widespread ST depression and this widespread ST depression has caused reciprocal ST elevation. That's why we don't thrombolize. This is not a true STEMI. So we have to remember that even though it is a ST, ST elevation in AVR, it is not a true STEMI. It is a reciprocal a manifestation of the ST depression in other leads. Basically, uh, the multi-segment, uh, the severe diffuse ischemia due to either left main disease or proximal LAD disease cause the large area of ischemia in the myocardium and ST depression. So these ST depressions in the lateral, inferior and posterior leads can be manifested as ST elevation in AVR. So that's why we don't give thrombo uh, 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 thrombolysis for these patients.
सो कॉसेस फॉर ए वी आर एस रियलेशन डिफ्यूज बेन टू कार्डियल स्कीम या हो इनफाक्शन ऑफ द बेसल सेप्टम वेरी रियली बट इट्स ऑलवेज ऑलमोस्ट ऑलवेज एसोसिएटेड एंटीरियर स्टेमी और अदरवाइज डिफ्यूज स्कीम या सो अदर थिंग इज द रिस्क दीज पेशेंट्स हैव वेरी हाई रिस्क ऑफ मॉर्टिलिटी एंड द मॉर्टिलिटी इज प्रपोर्शन टू द एस टी एलिवेशन सो हायर द एस टी एलिवेशन हायर द मॉर्टिलिटी सो दे नीड अर्ली कॉर्नर एंजियोग्राम एंड मोस्ट ऑफ दे मे एंड अप इट सी ए बी जी इफ अर्ली सी ए बी जी सो बेटर नॉट टू गिव इनोक्स इवन क्लोपिडोग्रेल इफ यू कैन अरेंज अर्ली एंजियोग्राम बिकॉज पेशेंट द गिविंग क्लोपिडोग्रेल कैन बी प्रॉब्लमेटिक सो आइडियल मैनेजमेंट वुड बी गिव एसप्रीन ट्रीट विथ इनोक्सापारिन और हेपरिन एंड गो फॉर अर्ली एंजियोग्राम एंड डिसाइड ऑन द मैनेजमेंट बट इन आवर सेटअप अर्ली एंजियोग्राम एंड इवन अर्ली सी ए बी जी इज नॉट फीसिबल फॉर मोस्ट ऑफ द पेशेंट्स अनफॉर्चुनेटली दिस मेजोरिटी ऑफ दिस पेशेंट्स विल बी मैनेज मेडिकली so important thing is there is no need for thrombolysis the third case 54 year old male diabetic hypertension and dyslipidemia admitted with acute onset shortness of breath with central chest tightness for few hours no history of ischemic heart disease blood pressure is slightly high few basal creps no murmurs this is the ecg the ecg shows uh, heart rate of uh, Around 60, and uh, there is ST depressions in V1, V2, and V3. ECG is in sinus rhythm, and VR is normal. And there is, you can see, slight hyperacute type T waves in L2, L3, and AVF. So this could be either a non-ST elevation of anterior or a posterior myocardial infarction. So best thing is to repeat the leads on the Six seven eight. All right. Now you can see, as you can see, the seven eight nine ECGs are taken. Seven is posterior axial line, fifth intercostal space. Eight is below the spine. Nine is just transverse spine of the same space. I've shown that one millimeter elevation. This is very sensitive. If you can get point five to one millimeter, that's very significant, and you have to do it as early as possible because these ECG changes can disappear in the next hour. So to recognize if the twelve ECG is normal, if the patient comes with acute coronary syndrome, best thing is to repeat the seven, eight, nine ECGs. Now this suggests and confirms that this is a posterior myocardial infarction. Okay, let's move to the case four, fourth case. This is a 42-year-old patient with dyslipidemia, defaulted management, family history of premature ischemic heart disease in paternal side, ex-smoker. Pa patient had a significant central chest pain. He described as seven out of ten, and he present very airy. Thanks to our ambulance. This is the first ECG. The ECG shows the normal heart rate, sinus rhythm, but there are some. Uh, Negative Q waves in three and AVF, and also in lead two, and the anterior leads are showing a little bit of hyperacute type T waves. I think it's best to repeat this ECG and see again. Yes, Dr. Stanley described there is a Q waves in lead three and AVF, so it can be an old inferior MI. So this patient, even though he didn't give a history of ischemic heart disease, is very likely to have a significant coronary artery disease. So, this patient, because of severe chest pain, it's managed as acute coronary syndrome. But apparently, there is no acute ischemic changes. Q in uh, the old uh, so inter his troponin high sensitivity troponin was done, and it was eight. Uh, it is eight. Actually, it's negative on admission. Troponin was negative. Then ECG repeated one hour later. that is no much significant changes compared to the previous ecg still remain uh, looks very tall t waves but there is no st depression or other t wave changes so the second hour troponin came as 458 pain is much better hemodynamic stable so team decided troponin is positive there is no significant ecg changes patient was transferred to the medical ward with management of uh, diagnosis of non stemi this is around 4 Five o'clock or six o'clock in the evening. So unfortunately, in the medical ward, he didn't have any repeat ECGs. And the next next day, patient was much better. So inoxaparin was next next uh, continued. ECG was done 10 a.m. the next day. This the ECG. 
The ECG shows the uh, there's two inversions in all these anterior leads and also in inferior leads and lateral leads. So this suggests that this patient has a proximal LAD lesion with a anterior myocardial infarction. Yeah, there is a Q waves in the two, three, no, uh, we lead V2, V3, V4, yeah. even, yeah, so there is a Q wave infarction. Actually, we have missed the yeah. anterior STEMI by now. Patient came yesterday 4 p.m. The third ECG, the first and second ECG is done 4 p.m. and 5 p.m. The third ECG was done at next day 10 a.m. So a patient has developed a ST elevation. He presented early, developed ST elevation, but we missed to diagnose it because we didn't repeat ECGs. So he missed the proper management. So actually this is a, not a late presentation, late diagnosis of anterior STEMI. Now, unfortunately, there is no indication for tenecta thrombolysis because the 12 hour patient is now pain free, the 12 hours has gone. So this is a relatively common presentation now, thanks to our ambulance, they came very early and they present with a, so ECG shows hyperacute ECGs, but no other ST changes or T inversion. So we think these ECGs are normal. And troponin, if we have facilities, they can be, uh, even if you have high sensitive troponin, it can be marginally positive if you done very early. So then when before sending to medical load, best thing was to repeat at least three or four ECGs. And even after sending to medical loads, we have to repeat few ECGs before diagnose, labeling them as normal ECGs. So this is the angiogram. I think most of us, most of uh, you all don't have much uh, understanding about the coronary angiogram. This is the LAD. Actually, LAD is completely gone. This is after urgent PCI. This angiogram was done because this late uh, diagnosis and it is actually our failure so we contacted the cardiology team because this is our failure so they accept the patient and did the angiogram and stented but outcome won't be the same as if we did it earlier now the myocardium is probably most of the myocardium is dead non-viable even though artery looks good so ejection fraction will be low any comments yeah i think uh you know, even uh, because he's a diabetic and uh, in the absence of chest pain, he's within 24 hours. And uh, he, although ECG shows key waves, I think it's worth going for an angiogram and opening the vessel because there may be, uh, there's a ischemic prenumbra in the myocardium uh, which can be saved on these patients. Yeah, according to the guideline, I think up to 48 hours, oh, there yes. is an indication for opening, but after 48, there is no indication. But the important thing is we should not miss this anterior early presentation of anterior stemis or whatever stemis. Yeah, the whole mark is when you see the T waves are upright and tall and you think it, they are hyperacute, you must make sure that until you diagnose the case that it can be an anterior myocardial infarction, particularly in anterior leads. The last case, a man in his 50s with history of type 2 diabetes, hypertension and dyslipidemia presented with one day history of, of an on and off chest pain and epigastric discomfort. He described it as gas pain, gastritis. The examination was normal, but he's a bit ill looking and sweaty. This is the ECG. Yeah, this ECG, the patient has a heart rate of about 80 and the sinus rhythm in normal PR interval but the axis is uh, on the left axis with some uh, key waves in T3 and AVF. And also there is a hyperacute type of uh, T's with a slightly upsloping ST's on uh, V1, v, sorry, V2, V3, V4, V5. So this again indicates that one has to think of uh, ongoing ischemia and you need to repeat the ECG. Actually, this is the 20 minutes later. Yeah, that looks uh, more hyperacute than last time and the STs are uh, more prominent. Uh, so I think we are going ahead with an anterior myocardial infarction progressing. Uh, yes, ideally, apart from the hyperacute uh, T waves, you can concentrate on the ST segments. If, you, if I can show the previous ECG. 
there is no ST depression. Yes. Here there is a slight ST depression. Even the very first ECG, you can yeah. see there's a slight ST depression in V3 and V4, even there, V5. Sort of Upsloping ST, up -sloping ST yes. depression. Yeah. yeah. This is remarked in this yeah. ECG. This is pathognomic of anterior, uh, very proximal LAD syndrome. Yeah. So we don't have to wait for gross ST elevation in this case. Yes. This is the third ECG, one hour, this, the, but this wasting of tau yeah, that's time. a very early stage of anterior myocardial infarction. This is called De Winter syndrome. This an anterior, st the, actually this ECG is a anterior STEMI equivalent. So you can activate the cath lab or you can give, if you are very confident, you can give thrombolysis even. So all prominence, symmetrical T waves in the precordial leads. The, the, usually De Winter doesn't describe by in, uh, inferior, hypercute T waves can be seen in any leads, even inferior, anterior, lateral, but De Winter is, almost always anterior. Upslope in ST segment depression, it's upslope in ST segment depression more than one millimeter at J point in the precordial leads. Absence of ST elevation in the precordial leads. Actually this developed before ST elevation and usually it, since it's very proximal LAD, it supplies, this, uh, it can affect the first septal branch, though there is a ST elevation in the AVR as well and usually and the uh, <laughs> then within one or two hours, normal ST elevation will develop. The, another example, this is a separate, uh, different patient, but you can see classical J, uh, ST, upsloping ST depression in V2, V3, V4, V5, even V6 in this patient. This is another patient. These are somewhat rare presentation than the valence syndrome. Valence is 10 to 15 percent of our acute coronary non-stemmies will be valent, but this is around 1 to 2 percent. So you might not see these patients, but this is a early indicator. The indication the, you have to be very careful of these patients because you can save a lot of myocardium if we treat them very early. And these are the important uh, as a summary. I would like to. So five, uh, four cases I described and one more additional thing in which uh, you don't see classical ST elevations but almost equal to ST elevations and high risk acute coronary syndrome. The one, the first one is first diagonal branch of the LAD territory ischemia uh, in, uh, occlusion. So it's a diagonal, first diagonal supply large part of the left ventricle. So it can cause significant LD dysfunction if we ignore this. In this case, you won't see significant ST elevation in the precordial leads. Usually it's associated with AVL and 1. So, so 1 and AVL this is called high lateral ST elevation MI. And usually it is associated with inverted T waves in 3 and AVF because this ST elevation in the high lateral segment is reciprocal to the inferior part. So in inferior leads will identify this ST elevation as ST segments. So those are not due to inferior ischemia, actually inferior, these are reciprocal changes in the anterior uh, lateral myocardial wall. The, third, the second one is we discussed the de winter upslope in ST depression at J point uh, segments without ST elevation with tall symmetrical T wave. This indicate very proximal LAD occlusion. The third one is left main occlusion or left main equivalent. In this case, actually if somebody has a complete left main occlusion, very unlikely to have normal hemodynamics, he will be in a cardiogenic shock and will be dead in few minutes. Very unlikely to come to cath lab with a completely occluded left main. So the, most of these patients has partial occlusion of the left main with a significant occlusion of the LAD and circumflex. So their flow is maintained but there's significant significant ischemia. So they have widespread ST depressions and as a result they got reciprocal ST elevation in the AVR. The important thing is we should not thrombolize these patients. They have we have to give standard management with inoxaparin and early angiogram. The valence syndrome deeply inverted T waves or biphasic T waves in the anterior leads indicate proximal LAD 
syndrome and there is no q wave so poor r wave progression in these ecgs the last one is a posterior wall acute if it is associated with inferior mi it's easy to diagnose because there is a st elevations in the inferior leads but isolated posterior yes, you will see the mirror image of the st elevation in v1 v2 v3 sometime v1 you won't see any significant st depression is st depression can be limited to vt uh, v2 and v3 so if there is a good r wave with st depression in v2 and v3 with a background of chest pain always we have to suspect posterior mi and better to do v6 uh, v7 v8 v9 leads to look for posterior infarction uh, i think that's all uh, we have to discuss today thank you so uh, thank you dr arnav j singh and dr stanley amrasekar for that very interesting and informative course case based discussion